So uh, as a, I start off my career in film and TV um, for four or five years. And uh, I got the benefit of coming to NAB uh, because I was a video editor at the time and I wanted to sort of understand what's the technology out there. I remember 94, 95, the Avid was just invented. And it was a big deal. And AVR7 came out and I was like, oh my god, I got to see that. I remember, it was VHS quality. But as far as I was concerned, it was on a computer and, far, and that was a big, big move. And now we're here um, in 2017, real, realistically, almost you know, 20, 20, 20 plus years later. And 20 plus years later, it has created a, um, it's a down a different path. I would say there is a technology still at, at the core, I would say in the bones is still technology, uh, whether it's camera technology or a technology that allows you to re, you know, compress video more efficiently you know, and in a smaller box. Um, but I, I walked the floor uh, this afternoon, just before my session, and I found two things that stood out to me. One uh, was a th the f uh, there was one moment in my life where I had uh, you know, it was this hologram conversation. Eventually, we'll be looking through our phones and be able to talk to someone. We'll be looking, th we'll be able to see someone. Now that happened with FaceTime. You know, I'm talking to someone and they're right there, and uh, that happened. And the next level then is that how do I make them feel more three-dimensional? And uh, that three-dimensionality I saw today in a booth uh, where a big spinning disc goes around in a circle and it has an LED panel. And that m moment suddenly shifted for me. Of course, there was 35 people surrounding the booth going, how are they doing that? But the point was there is the technology sort of underpinnings and then there's the leading edge. And the things I saw on the leading edge, while drones, of course, have been the th been the popular piece, VR and AR, as well as now this three-dimensional hologram, which was spectacular, uh, totally changed. Um, and, and it evolved for me what I know the future of NAB will be. I think the companies that are sort of on that bleeding edge are endlessly going to be in some, in some capacity in pain. Because um, even the best technologies that are out there that we, that we know are something are kind of wrong. They're wrong a little bit. And that it takes that two or three times of someone like, how about this, how about that, how about this, and then bang, it hits. My perspective is that, uh, I think it's Buddhism, I'm almost positive, it's that life is suffering. And that a lot of times in what we're looking at and what we're seeing here in this particular environment of the NAB in 2017 isn't really the, um, isn't really the first time we're seeing it. Uh, it's many times we're seeing it, and, and iterations, and here's another drone, and here's a drone that follows you, and here's a drone that comes up out of a van. I get it, it's a drone. But what's the thing that's really going to inspire an audience to, in, to engage and, and interact? That's what, I'm, that's what I believe that bleeding edge requires, is people to mess it up four or five times, and then finally they land on the idea. We just had a panel that I came from, and I asked everyone this question, you know, what thing are you seeing that's keeping you up at night? What thing are you feeling concerned about? And they all answered their own questions. But the truth is, they all answered the, the, with their, the thing that they, they all answered with the thing that they screwed up, basically, the big, biggest mistake that they made. What was the biggest mistake that they made? And they all felt that the mistakes that they had made, and I agree, all mistakes that you make don't really stop you from being successful. It's the mistake that allows you to find the conclusive solution to like, this is how we'll move on. I, I think we all do. Uh, I had the Newton, there it goes, right? I had the Newton and then I had the Palm Pilot and then I had my T-Mobile and then suddenly I got the, uh, you know, I got into the, you know, the, the more evolved Palm and then finally, you know, after a while I gave up and then went back to the, finally got the iPhone. The point is, Anybody who is willing to endure that leading edge conversation and driving what the future of technology is going to be is an influencer of the future. And I am, for example, looking at the AR, the VR in particular, uh, you know, around the, the exhibit halls, it's still the same thing. It's all about in sort of engage, this singular internally engaged person. I would argue the next thing that we're going to see in the near term will be how do I, because it feels as you, I don't know if you've had a chance to see it, but when you look at it and you're seeing someone engaging, it's very inside. There's no external, as a matter of fact, if they stood up, they would fall over because it's, you, you can. <laughs> uh, and you have disorientation. 
uh, I would argue that the next thing we're going to see is how do two people who are living in a VR space interact with one another. Um, I won't go into the, sort of the, the most, most of the inventions and where they come from, but the truth is this is something that will happen. We'll start to see people engaging with one another and they'll feel a little less bad about having, you know, um, living in this, uh, you know, this, you know, goggle on my face way of expressing. I believe AR will be the logical step that everyone will feel comfortable with, like my glasses, for example, which are not anything awesome at this point, but soon we'll have the ability to have a, a small little thing projected onto my glasses only that I see as a reflection of something that's important around me that I need to know about. That's enough of an AR expression that gives me that sort of heads up display of here's what's happening on television right now, here's a big news item, much like our iPhone that we carry with, carry with us. Um, these will be another device that now is expressing the thing that we want. The next major step though, which is what I think you're getting to, which I didn't see here, was you know, that, that autonomous driving vehicle. That is the next major move for all of the, you know, the, in, everyone to sort of be focusing on. If you have an extra hour a day in your life to deal with and do something, what, what are you gonna fill it with? I mean, people might read a book, which would argue, I would, I would love that, uh, uh, but likely they will just go back to their entertainment, adding another hour of entertainment. Um, this great woman who I've been working with a lot, Joanna Pena Bickley, who was the, uh, the most recent, she's the, she's the CEO of uh, Think, um, she was the most recent C CEO of, um, of IBM, uh, IBM, their creative division. And she's talk she talked a lot about, you know, your iPhone or your phone is the device that you carry. The car will be the device that carries you. And I, I love that thought because it's still a device. We're still considering, we've now evolved the car backwards into a device. And if it's an autonomous driving vehicle, it is a device. It's just something a little more important that you're safe doing. So drones now, and the extension, of course, seeing into autonomous driving vehicles is where it's going to be. At the NAB, I project that in two to three years, you'll start to see autonomous driving content. What can you watch in your car? And that should be, you know, be at the NAB. I would think the, um, the change that we might see with how content is played in a car, for example, might be grossly different than how you would s appreciate it if you were just watching it on a TV. It should be location specific. Although I do see one of the major challenges that we have with, with VR, for example, is that everyone's used to watching content on a, on a flat screen. They're just sort of used to sitting and watching. With VR, the way the content is actually concepted, you have to think about getting someone to look a different direction. And that is really, really hard. Like, it's over here. And if you're just looking one way, you're missing the whole story that's happening over there. Now, of course, we live our lives, so we hear a sound and we turn to our right or our left, so we get the point. That content could easily be trans transposed into a car situation. So you can have a VR situation in a car while you're driving, going from A to B, and having a VR experience, even though it has nothing, you're you know, on the, you know, the hills of, of Mars, except you're in the hills of you know, San Fernando. Right. That's a thing. <laughs> Valley. I, I did see the, um, there was a few, probably maybe 5% of what I saw from a camera perspective was a three, uh, 360 degree camera which is probably a reasonable way to capture everything. But when you think about a storyteller, they don't want you just looking anywhere. They want you to look somewhere very specific uh, to tell the story. Um, so while it's a solve, it's one of these sort of mistakes on the way. It's not totally the answer. It's definitely an answer. Um, and it will solve the current challenge of, well, how do you make VR content? Well, you use this camera. But how do you tell a story that's really, really sharply told that forces you to engage in a certain way that will require the next iteration and the next iteration, which is why it's so important that you know, shows like this exist that allow people to sort of say like, okay, here's the thing we have today, the most leading edge, leading edge thing. How do we take advantage and apply that to the current needs of our audiences and the needs of, the, of brands that want content like this? Truthfully, when you think about a director's point of view, they still think of this two-dimensional plane. 
the new directors that are coming up that are you know ages of my children, the nine and ten year olds or eight nine year olds, they'll need the ability to actually express themselves in a very different way because they're used to multiple channels, they're used to engaging in multiple ways, and that is what I think is going to be the future. You know, I, and at that point there will be another mistake and another iteration, and VR right now and is, is the is the current. You know, let's talk about how we're going to use that. But soon we'll find out in the next three or four years what the next thing will be. And I believe that a lot of those those pieces are going to be connected to, you know, entertainment because it, what, it it's what drives people to create more things, and more things creates devices or ability to capture, and that obviously creates business and commerce. So it makes the world go round. I hadn't heard the stat on the 8x piece yet, but it's not, it's not horribly un, unbelievable to me. Knowing that I'm engaging in a passive way on a couch, so to speak, it doesn't let me learn as well as if I can look myself and almost touch or feel something, look closely at something, really engage, just like we would do in sort of our you know, human form. Um, I think if education is the killer app for how VR will sort of express itself, immediately you'll see almost every brand try to find a way to employ an educating, an educating philosophy into their brand you know, platforms. How do I get someone to understand how, the feel, how it feels to sit in the seat of a BMW? How does it feel? What is it like? And of course, they have to be working on this because it's critically important. They work on it as a sort of a car pass-through and it's still two-dimensional. But the, 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 the corollary, I think, in education is awareness and ability to engage in defining the sort of fascinating piece about this that only, only this small set knows and that they're desperate to get people to be aware of it. That is a, would be a home run for brands to start to do if, in fact, educating is the way to go. Although, educating right now is done primarily by the government, uh, unless you're sort of using you know, other, another channel. I could see Khan Academy, for example, uh, which is a brilliant infrastructure, um, starting to think about, let me push into VR and see if it helps children you know, engage more deeply, understand something better. Because um, right now it's still it's flat and it's you know it's flat, <laughs> but I, I would like to see that uh, be only because I recognize how slow government is to move and change how children are educated or how anybody is edu educated frankly up through you know you know uh, institutions and universities. I think it could really impact um, so many different things if in fact, 8x is the is the factor. Um, that would be a, a fascinating thing to explore to see how brands start to take advantage of it. Uh, to feel of two minds about this because I'm a publisher and I own, you know, I, I'm responsible for a brand that does a lot of branded integration elements. I feel that it can work and it can be very successful if the content is, is amazing and it always has to be amazing. The thing that we found to be the most successful kinds of content is the content that generally is just brilliant stuff. And the brilliant stuff tends to connect with an audience. And if it connects with an audience, they'll in fact engage with it in a more deeply and they'll more, they're even more likely I, I don't have the research to tell you the exact number, but I'm going to say at least 5x more likely to share it because they don't feel like I'm shilling when they're sharing it. They're like, this is a great piece of content. It deserves to be shared. It deserves to be seen. It was funny. It was smart. It was sad. Whatever it was, it works as a, as a piece of content that's pushed out. When you add a brand on top of it, you have to realize, is it good enough? Did it hit, did it hit the mark? You know, Red Bull, for example, is very famous for making amazing pieces of content that are heavily shared, but they, they are embedded in the content and, and now actually Red Bull has become a media company because of the brand's popularity of how much wonderful content they create. Those two things, the high bar for branded content is getting higher and higher, for better and better. How far from space can you jump? You know, that would be, I'll watch it, okay, yeah, I know it's sponsored by you know, Red Bull, I, I don't care, I'll watch it. And, or the other side of it is how great can the content be and how relevant is it to me and it, whether or not it's, it's given to me by a, uh, by a brand or not, it's just great content. And if it's, if it's 
if it's if, if, if a brand is woven in there delicately, I don't care. As a matter of fact, I'll just say, you know what? It was a great. It was relevant. It was. It made sense that they were in a bar that they were drinking Grey Goose. Totally logical. I wouldn't argue with it. But if it's sponsored by Grey Goose and they're only like Grey Goose is great, don't you think Grey Goose is great? It ends up being this sort of unrealistic conversation that no one would ever say. So if you back into realism and have a, a rational conversation, everybody's going to be much more comfortable with that.